اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وذاق الباطل ان الباطل كان الباطل ونمثل من القران ما هو شفاء ورحمه للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين الا خطاء صدق الله صدق الله العظيم Mr. Chairman and Brethren, the subject that has been suggested to me by Brother Rizwan, I think he forgot to mention the subject. The subject for this evening talk is Hinduism and Islam. Chronologically, in order of age, Islam is the youngest of the world's religions, And Hinduism and Zoroastrianism, they both vie for being the oldest religions in the world. From Islam, if you go backwards, beginning of Islam, 1400 years ago, our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought this deal of Islam to its perfection, of the guidance of God. But 600 years beyond Islam, we find the religion of Christianity. At 600 years before that, Buddhism, and a few thousand years before that, Hinduism. So Hinduism claims to be the oldest of the world religion. Where does this word Hinduism come from? It comes from the Indus River. The river passing through Pakistan, in undivided India, in the northwest. The Indus River. And people have certain characteristics in speech. But sometimes, where there is no edge, they add an edge. Where there is edge, people eat it up. You know, describing the situation in the city hall I was mentioning to our people, I said, you see, there is a group of people among us, Indians, our own people, that they pick up edge in Hambilo, you know, Hambilo, they say Hambilo, and they drop it off in Hillary, Hillary, they say Hillary. So, same thing happens to this Indus business. Indus river, people say Hindus. Indus, there was no edge, they put a Hindus, Hindu. People living around the Indus valley, Hindu. The land, Hindu. So, this is how this name has been given, Hinduism. The ism, or the culture, or the setup, or the belief of the people of the Indus valley, Hindu. Now, if I may to give you, in one word, the difference between Islam and Hinduism. One word. You see, the Hindu, in his theology, he says, everything is God. Everything is God. The Muslim, what does he say? He says, everything is God. The difference is only that of an apostrophe S. Hindu says everything is him. Islam says everything is his. Everything belongs to Allah. The other guy says everything is he. So, and this little apostrophe S, you know what a stupendous difference it makes in two concepts of God. That if you say everything is he, everything is he, then therefore the Hindu, according to that concept, he doesn't hesitate in worshiping the cow, the monkey, the elephant. Name, man, woman, tree, sea, mountain, anything, everything. Because he reasons that God created everything by his word. Everything, how did he create? He also believes that Allah created by his will, but you somehow as well up, because to him Allah is you, the primal origin of the heavens and the earth. وَإِذَا قَدَا أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ That whenever he is a matter, he manages to be and it is. It is word of command. Actually, it is his will. We describe it as a word. So everything he created by his word. Allah tells us in the Holy Quran that if the oceans were made into him and all the trees were made into him, the words of our Lord cannot be exhausted. So many creations. Everything by his word. In other words, by his will. He brought everything to be. So now because it is the word of God, 
That's what they would be. The Hindu says the word of God is God. His word is God. We say the word of God is not God, it is His word. As I am speaking to you, my words are not me. Me and my words are different. Similarly, the Muslim reason, the word of Allah and Him are different things. They are His words, but they are not Him. The Hindu says His word is Him. So he starts worshiping anything, everything. As such, he is a time he is. See, we are thinking wrongly of the Hindu, thinking that he is a policy. Policy means believing more than one God. He doesn't. So he can't explain. He says, Rama is God, the Krishna is God, the Buddha is God, the Hanuman is God. So I think how many gods are there? He's confused. But really, he doesn't believe in many gods. He says, everything is God, because God is in everything. So he's prepared to God, worship God in this form, and that form, and that form, and end the form. But he's the God is one. He says God is one. So he is a time he is when he believes that everything is God, not a polytheist believing in this many God. Now, when we talk about Hinduism, immediately in our mind, these terms they occur, they come to mind. Incarnation. Incarnation. Reincarnation. Karma, idolatry, English associated with all these terms, terminology. Incarnation, a system in which people believe that God Almighty comes down to earth as a man. He becomes human being. God Almighty, he comes down to earth, born of a woman, he becomes a man. Incarnation, meaning God taking human form. Reincarnation, meaning when you die, it's not the end. But you will come back to life again on this earth. And you die again, and you can come back to life again onto this earth. Again and again until you reach perfection. It can be a million rebirths. You can be born a million times over. Until you reach Nirvana. He is an attraction with God. Then you can do the universe with God. You become one with God. You become God. That's reincarnation. Being born again and again into this world, in human form. Karma is the philosophy of believing a law of cause and effect. That every cause has an effect. You put your finger into the fire, you get burned. Cause, effect. If you eat too much, you have a stomach ache. Cause, effect. But now, the Hindu believes that that effect takes place here on this earth. We believe that there is a cause and effect, but it will be on a higher plane. We will have to account for our deed. That's the plan. We believe that every cause has an effect. Whatever you do, you are going to be recompensated, good or bad. As you sow, so you will reap. Whatever you sow, you will get the fruits of it, good or bad. But that does not necessarily take place on this earth, that you don't have to come back here on this earth to give an account. And I got a free, meaning they believe they are worshipping God through the means of different, different statues, idols. Now, it is not possible during the period of this talk to give you like a clinical analysis of all these terms going deep. Because don't you, everyone becomes a subject. Actually, Hinduism is such a vast thing that it calls for a series of thoughts, not just one thought, giving it in one big nutshell that it uses Hinduism. But for the purpose of this, this session tonight, we will be forced to give you a broad outline of the things that I have just mentioned. And in passing, you'll be able to see them all, inshallah. Now, as we are gathered here, from what I can see, we are all Indian Muslims. I don't know if there is an Arab among you. Is there? Any Arab here? No. Huh? Any Malay? No. As the people as a whole that we have gathered here, it looks like we are all of Indian extraction. Now, one of the easiest ways of trying to approach the Hindu, to talk to him, to reason with him is to confess at the outset that our people, you know, our forefathers were Hindus. I know when I was young, I was getting shocked. You know, when the Hindu point of thing and say you people were are Hindus, he's trying to say that you were also Hindus. We didn't know how to say that we are Hindus. Or maybe when he said you are Hindus, meaning you are a Hindu. 
the Hindi, the word for India, India, the India, Hind, we are from Hind, so just thinking that everybody from Hind is a Hindu, whereas everybody from Hind is a Hindi, we are all Hindi, in English is the Indian. We are Hindi, but we are not Hindu. Hindi and Hindu are different things. The guy is getting confused. He thinks now, being from him, we are Hindi, being here, Hindu. Our forefathers were Hindu. And we have been Hindu for 5,000 years. If somebody wishes to claim that he's got some Arab blood in him, good luck to him. Somebody says he's got some Persian blood in him, good luck to him. Somebody says he's got some Turkish blood in us, good luck to him. But coming from India, our ancestors were all Hindu. Now once you confess that, you see, it makes it easier for the Hindu to listen to you. You see, yes, I'm our people, my people, what happened? How is it that this guy is talking differently now? So now they start quoting the subject. And I have been using a technique, and I live in Berlin, that's about 30 kilometers outside Berlin. And Berlin is today Indian, according to our government regulations, the majority of the people are Indian, so they made an Indian culture. Coming from Berlin, Ottawa, Indian, Mount Dixon, Indian. And as I come from Berlin, come to the Berlin, I find some Indian people standing by the roadside, so I give them lift to something that is uh, out, seems to be beyond my control. You know, my wife keeps on telling me to go and give this to anybody, because they have been reading a lot of things, you know what happens to people, give this and they get back and the car gets stolen and they don't find the husband anymore. <laughs> but somehow I feel that the Indian who is standing on the roadside is not waiting to bat you on the head. The Indian. The white man, unfortunately, we have to say it again and again, he bashes us many times. The most dangerous guy in South Africa is the white man. Not the Indian. Not the colored, not the African. If he wants to bash your head, he'll come and look for you. He'll find you and he'll do his job. But he won't stand on the roadside waiting for a lift to do that. So, I'm compelled, in some type of compulsion, inner compulsion, see in India, I just want to go on, but I can't help it. I stop the car as we get inside. Now, once that fellow gets inside the car, I must talk to him now, I want to make him pay for the lift. Not in money, but, you know, you must do a job of work. So immediately, I start, I just, what church do you belong to? And if you ask that question, it's an innocent question. Nobody gets offended by such a question. What church do you belong to? So either he says, any church is easy name, or he might say, I'm a Hindu. Now if he says he's a Christian, he is a type of a customer. Sometimes I give a white guy a list, and I know he's a Christian. So what I church you belong to, he gives me a name. I said, do you know? What do you know he's a Christian? He said, you know that there are three types of Indians in South Africa? The guy gets a shop. There are three types of Indians in South Africa. He doesn't know. You mean all Indians are the same. You can see our complexion. I know there are various shades of grey. But overall, you know, there is a dial about of all that says Indian, 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 Indian. No, my one is black and one is black and one is black and one is black and Indian, 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 Indian. So this is what you're talking about three types of Indians. So here there's only one type of Indian. As much as to our fathers, there was only one type of white man, European. When I was young, we said European, we said European was a nation, and South African government also put it that way, European, non-European. That's how they classified it. In our family, in the railways, everywhere. European, non-European. The Europeans, we are thinking, is a nation. But we know better now that European is not a nation. They are not thinking it's white and black, but European is not a nation. Europe is a continent, and on that continent there are many nations, like the Greeks, the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Free, the English, the Irish, the Scots. These are different nations. But because we don't know the difference, all white people is one nation. Similarly, these all brown people are one nation. So when you tell them that there are three types of Indians in South Africa, they get the shock of their life. I said, you know, racially, we are dozens of different types. Racial. And the proof of that is, there is a Gujarati Muslim, they call me Turki, there is a Memon, there is a Kokrin, there is a Nyabai, there is a Hyderabadi, there is a Polish. You know the people from Hyderabad, when I met them in America, 
that person hears those signals, those messages, and he conveys them to us on a human level, sound way. I shall not commit adultery, I shall not forget my neighbor's wife, I shall not kill, I shall not kill. You see, on a human level, we can understand what he's talking about. Such a person, we say, is a prophet of God. He is a mouthpiece of God. He speaks with the words of God, but he is not God. So the Hindu believes in many incarnations, the Christian believes in one incarnation, the Muslim believes in many incarnations. Now this is in a nutshell. See the Muslim reasons that how can the Almighty, how can the ocean be contained in the water? The Almighty, you know, listen, it's anything like you, this. No, this is the Muslim concept. God does not become a man. And it is not necessary for God to become a man, to understand the problem of man. Because this logic is true. It's logical, but it's not true. If it is true, then God must make up, become a monkey to understand the problem of a monkey. He must become a donkey to understand the problem of a donkey. He must become a populist to understand the problem of a populist. What kind of a God is this? He says, no. The Creator knows what He has made. If you made the table, you know what the table is. You don't have to become a table to understand a table. If you made the people for Satan, outside. Okay. You don't have to become a beetle for Satan to understand a false The Maker knows what He has made. If God made us, He knows. And as such, He is qualified and He is authoritative. He has the authority to dictate to you, to tell you how this machine ought to behave. He has a right to give you instruction. He doesn't have to become a man to understand the problem of man. Now, about a hundred years ago, you know, when we came to this country, the Average Indian was 80% Hindu, 20% Muslim, and 1% Christian. So when I had these Hindus getting into the car, I presented this to them. I said, you know, when we came, our oh, forefathers, a hundred years ago, this was our average ratio of our people. But as today, you know what? The Muslim is still 20% of the Indian population. In other words, if we lost half a dozen, we might have gained a dozen. Overall, the average remained the same. But the Christian has jumped from 1 to 17 percent in the Indian community. 1 to 17. So I'm asking where did the other 15 percent come from? In a blind saucer? From outer space? No. He is quickly, he says, from the Hindu. So the question arises why is it that the Hindu is getting converted and the Muslim is not getting converted? Ah, not in total. I mean, we can also lose our sons and daughters, which we are. You see? But if we lost half a dozen, we might have gained a dozen. So overall, the average has still remained the same. But the Hindu has been reduced by 16% in the past 50 years, not 100 years. Because most of this propagation work among the Indians has been done by the Christians in the past 50 years. They lost 16% of the people. And at this rate, in a thousand years, the, you know, the Hindu will be a museum, thing, museum people. If you come across a person, you know your grandchildren, you say, what church you belong to? The Hindu side. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you have. Because the way, at the rate of which they are losing, it will be like something should be in a museum. So what do you mean? So the question is, how is it that the Hindu is getting converted? We'll say, and the Muslim is not. And we know that. So we are not saying, we are not denying that we could have lost our sons and daughters. Uh, the young man wanted to show his father a point. Or he met a Christian woman and somehow he went to heaven. He, this thing can happen. Or sometimes people can be brainwashed, or mixed marriages, we married non-Muslim women for the marriage of convenience, we converted the woman, and uh, she was neither here nor there, she was neither fish nor fowl, and the marriage broke up, and your Muhammad and your Fatima and your Khadija gone back again with the mother to the church and Christian. It's, it's happening again and again, we are losing thousands that way. We are marrying, you know, outside, Islam. We marry a colored woman, it's a good thing. Right, and the marriage doesn't work out. Look, among ourselves, there are times when marriages don't work out. And there are more chances of the marriages breaking if the woman is on the other side. Culturally, her standards for everything is different. She is used to jiving and, you know, going around with this guy and that guy, half a dozen guys she has experienced, and now you think, you know, you got everybody's shoot bones, now you put it around your neck, make a garland out of it, and the garland doesn't work. <laughs> so, where do your children go? Back again. She goes back to her aunties, her grannies, and your little ones, uh, she's going to church, they also go to church. So we have been living that way, you see. But as a people, as a whole, we are immune to conversion, as a whole.
So what makes it that the Hindu is getting converted and the Muslim not? So he might have had a case. He said, well, you know, our people are very ignorant about our religion. I said, look, like that, we also have ignorant who's among us. No sense. Who don't know how to read the Quran, they don't know how to make salah. Then even things they don't know about Islam, but they're Muslim. Born, the Muslim bow, carrying a Muslim flag, and then they die with them as Muslims. But perhaps they know nothing about Islam. It's, it's there. From experience, I know it is so. So we also have ignorant people among us, as much as you have. But I said, look, I might explain to you the reason. I may be wrong, but if I'm wrong, you would, I would like you to correct me. I said, you see, the Hindu is a very tolerant person. In, at home. <laughs> Not now in India. They're the most intolerant, you see. But the Hindu in his own family life is very tolerant. See, in a Hindu family, in a Hindu family, uh, if one of them, the father says, I believe in Ganesh, the elephant that is called. The other guy says, I worship Sifa, no problem. The other guy says, I worship Hanuman, no problem. The other guy says, I worship Sita, no problem. The one says, I believe in one God, no problem. The other guy says, I believe in no God, no problem. The other guy says, I believe in million gods, no problem. No problem. 